Hey friends, good to be with you again in this time, this way that we have to get together and connect and be edified in whatever God has to reveal to us today. So to start things off, of course, let's pray. Amazing God, I thank you once again for this opportunity to share your word, to share what you have placed on my heart. And I just ask that everything that, that I speak is your words, that it's your words through my lips. It's your message through my mouth. And let us be edified by you in this time, Lord. Let us be encouraged and strengthened to be your disciples who are called to go and make disciples, Lord. And just get, get rid of anything that's distracting us from your will and your ways and your pursuit to grow your kingdom for your people, for all your children, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends, let's get on with today's sermon. Okay, friends, I just want to warn you, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to finish, we're going to finish our talk on um, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 14. We're going to finish that. It's what we've been talking about um, the last, last couple of, the last few verses here. I'm going to, I'm not going to run through them. I'm going to do them their justice. I think there's still a lot of great things going on in the rest of 2 Timothy, um, but I've been talking a lot about discipleship. I'm sure a lot of you have heard some of the uh, some of the noise I've made. Some of it that wasn't really as um, I didn't do a lot of due diligence in the process of making that noise. I apologize for all of that, but it's all for the sake of making disciples. And I think that leadership and myself have come up with a way to to really facilitate the vision that God has placed on my heart to facilitate going to, and making disciples in the churches and out of the churches. And I know that God is going to bless our works no matter what we see with our own eyes, no matter what paper, what's on paper or or what's in the pews. It's not about that. It's about doing God's work for God's kingdom. And I know that we will all be blessed for being a part of it. So we're going to finish up 2 Timothy, and I'm going to lay out the vision that God has placed on my heart in partnership with all four churches and people outside of the churches. That's the most amazing thing. There are people who are ready to take a part of this vision that God has placed in front of me outside of the churches and inside of the churches already. So now I'm going to bring that to you. And and here's the cool thing. Once I get to that, it'll all make a lot more sense. But here's the cool thing. If what God's placed on my heart to make disciples is not what God's placed on your heart to make disciples, that's fine. But God is placing something on your heart to make disciples. And if you're not quite sure what it is, then please talk to me. Talk to somebody. Talk to Pastor Rachel. Talk to somebody else who you think is doing what you're supposed to be doing to go and make disciples. And we will figure out the best way to equip you the way God is calling you to make disciples. Because that's what it's all about. To me, it's make disciples or we take down our signs. And I'm sorry to be so blunt about it, but that's what Jesus said. Go and make disciples. He did not say sit and wait. And I think there's a little bit too much of that going on all over the world. Not just right here, all over the world. There's too much sitting and waiting. We're called to go and make. So, hey, let's finish up 2 Timothy, and we're going to get on with <clears throat> um, this vision that I think many of us are going to be a part of. So we've, uh, we have read through verses 6 through 11, so we're going to do 12, 13, and 14. Um, and then I will share the story that led to to all the conversations about the vision that God has placed on my heart for going and making disciples and then we're going to we're going to talk about it and we're going to see we're going to see what it looks like for us as a church to partner in doing that so here is 2 Timothy 1 6 through 14 for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands for God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which 
now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And this is where we left off last time, so listen a little more intently to these last few verses, so I, I'm not going to repeat myself too much since we're at the end of our verses. Verse 11, For which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me, and the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Last time we left off, Paul identified himself as the teacher of the gospel. And he claims in verse 12, which is why I suffer as I do. You know, I don't see Paul being clever here. Paul's in prison. Paul has not been treated very well, and he needs the attending of a physician constantly. So literally, Paul is in a perpetual state of suffering. But Paul does claim that this condition, because he chose to relentlessly pursue the truth of the gospel and spread it, as far he was able. He's in this condition because he chose to relentlessly pursue the spread of the gospel as far as he was able. So yes, Paul does suffer, but he's in this condition because he knows that his body, his life is worth getting the message of the gospel to as many people in as many places as possible. So because of this confidence in the gospel, Paul is able to say the rest of verse 12, which was, but I am not ashamed. So in verse 12, Paul starts off by saying, I suffer, yes, but I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. So listen to where Paul's energy comes from where Paul's confidence really comes from. We hear him say, I am not ashamed. So Paul realizes that many, many people may have just admitted defeat if they found themselves in his condition, in his circumstance. But Paul is not ashamed. Paul is fearless and faithful. And he says, this is why for I know whom I have believed. Paul chooses to believe Jesus, to believe God in flesh, the Messiah, our Savior, over all that the world, the enemy, the Romans, and the Jews are throwing at him. Would it have been easy for Paul to just give up and admit defeat? Yeah, absolutely. But Paul was convicted in truth and confident in the faith that he had in Christ Jesus. And that faith was unshakable, no matter what his circumstance was. Paul is an amazing example of the fearless disciple that we are all called to be still to this day. And Paul finishes the last two and a half verses by saying, I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Paul knows that God will see the work that he has done through. He'll see it through. God will see it through. Even if Paul does not see it himself, the Spirit, spread of Christianity that Paul is responsible for is innumerable. And Paul knew that the seeds he planted, that he was willing to risk his reputation and his life for, would be watered by God and grow for all eternity. Paul encourages us to live with this same level of fearless and relentless faith. The last verse, Paul reminds us that the power of the Holy Spirit dwells in us 
and that by its power, we can live into the faith example that Paul demonstrates. We can relentlessly pursue pouring out the gospel to everyone around us by our actions and by our words. And even if we do not see instant results, which is likely, we likely won't see it, we can have faith, just like Paul did, that God will grow the seeds planted by our efforts for eternity, and we will have taken part in building thy kingdom come. Especially if we follow the words of Paul in verse 13 that tell us, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So friends, that's really all I, all I have to say pretty much about 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 14 in these last couple of verses. And that's how I am being encouraged. All of the, all that I've talked to you about in 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 14 is how I've been encouraged, how I'm being encouraged to live into that discipleship attitude of the entire gospel and the lessons that we've just heard. And here, here's how I'll practice it. Here's how I'll preach the example that we've just heard of discipleship from Paul. That's how I spell leadership. Leadership is spelled E X A M. P -L -E. So I'm going to set the example of discipleship that I'm encouraging all of you to be. It'd be wrong for me to say, go and make disciples if I was not doing it myself or I was not willing to do it myself or doing something to go and make disciples. How can I tell you to go make disciples? How can I, how can I really say that, even though Jesus said it and we all should, no matter who says it, after Jesus. But how can I really say that and expect you to do it if I'm not? <clears throat> I can't be wrong to be hypocritical, and I'm sure there's some things that I'm hypocritical about, probably, but this is not going to be one of them. I want to go make disciples. So God has called me to do, and I believe that God has a way for me to help equip the churches to go and do the same and outside of the churches, which is incredible. Only God can work in that mighty of a way. So here's, here's, I wanted to give you some backstory, and then I'm going to show you some images and some bullet points that I think will help help you see into my vision of making disciples. Now this is where I'm, I'm going to, you know, I know we're on camera and everything, but I'm going to metaphorically step away from the pulpit, even though I think that this is, um, this is very, very good stuff. It's stuff that God's calling me into. It's stuff that I think God is calling us into. It's making disciples. It's biblical. This is a lot more um, vision casting and it's a lot more explaining of, of a system and a strategy more than it is preaching. So this is where I'm, I'm metaphorically, I'm stepping away from the pulpit because I, I will never use the pulpit as a podium. And I think this really tests that line. So I'm stepping away from the pulpit and I'm just going to vision cast right now. I'm going to tell you how I feel that we're going to exponentiate discipleship. We're going to have a dupli duplicable discipleship program. And uh, I don't even like that word, program. That's a, that's a dirty word. Um, but we're going to do it, and it's going to work, and it's going to be awesome. So I'm going to give you some backstory. Uh, for some time, for a long time, um, years, my wife and I have, have been concerned about our lack of making disciples and the lack of making disciples that we see in every church everywhere. There's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of talk about how to... How to, how to bring people in, how to, uh, how to be appealing and get a draw in. And I just have never liked that, to be honest. I think there's a there's part of that that's there that's valuable in a way, but I don't think that can be the primary conversation because Jesus said, go and make. Um, so we've, we've talked about that for a while, and really we've never seen an avenue to do it. In the last couple of months, that conversation got really serious. It's go and make disciples or... Don't call myself a Christian. That's really what it came down to to me. So I was about ready to call up the district and have a conversation about there's got to be some sort of way, some sort of avenue to really push for push forward in making disciples. Um, and if there's not, then I'm going to have to go figure it out. Before I had that sit down with the district, Katie watched somebody's dog. This somebody works through the conference with something called 
Greenhouse through their Light the Way campaign. West Ohio Conference has Light the Way campaign, and I'm I'm really blanket statementing a lot of this. West Ohio Conference has this thing called Light the Way campaign, and uh, Light the Way campaign taps into the resources of Greenhouse. Greenhouse is not exclusively United Methodist. There's a lot of leaders from other denominations and non-denominations in there, and essentially they're um, they're just ambitious people who uh, who help facilitate unique ministry settings. Um, for example, there's a, there's been like barns converted into a church. I think there was a movie theater converted into a church. And just in that area, it made sense. It mattered and it's been successful. Um, through Greenhouse, they have what's called Fresh Expressions, which would be a little bit more where I'm headed to. So I tapped into the resources they had. They said I should go for it. Um, this is a vision God's placed on my heart. They've actually seen this model work before uh, in some capacity, not exactly how I'm doing it. And they're going to work with me over the next six months to help fine tune it. I do not need to wait six months to launch what we're going to talk about, but it will be fine tuned over the next six months. And then even as time goes on, we'll all fine tune it together. So sat down with them, was really, really, really encouraged. And then I did call the district and said essentially what I said. We're going to have to figure out how to make disciples. I'm going to have to leave and, and just go do it because that's the real call from God. Um, that was There was a lot more details to that conversation. There was a lot more emotion to that conversation than I'm willing or than I'm able to pour out right now. But it was it was kind of intense. It was good. It was very holistic. It was a, it was a very good conversation with the district, um, and this all just happened uh, late September. So we had to kind of move fast, and then so the next piece of that conversation was my the district, myself, and Pastor Rachel meeting to really figure out what that looked like for time management, and essentially if it couldn't be figured out. I really wasn't worried about it because I was just going to go and do it anyway. And uh, I know that would have caused a little bit of, of heartache. Uh, it would have been a very hard transition. But I had to listen to God. And that's really what it came down to. In between me personally meeting with the district and then the meeting that was supposed to happen with the three of us, someone had a meeting with me. Um not really out of nowhere, but really kind of unexpectedly with the way the meeting went at one of the churches, somebody from one of the churches, and they want to make disciples. They want to do exactly what I'm doing within the framework. It's all going to look different, but there's going to be a framework. And within that framework, they're going to facilitate making disciples. And that that made sure that that I'm going to make sure that this happens through the churches, through the churches and outside of the churches, because God will, God will really exponentiate discipleship if we can all do it together. And if we can do it outside of the churches to the people who, who are not tuned in to the faith and the relationships that we have together. So I was really encouraged to make sure that that we could figure it out together. A lot more conversation happened after the district I and Rachel met, but it was all great. Um, I made things move faster than I should have. And there was a, I, I caused probably some more anxiety than I should have, but leadership was amazing. Um, leadership has been, has a, has appreciated the, the vision has appreciated that they've heard so far. They've appreciated the passion and they've appreciated just wanting to move forward and make sure that we can all make disciples together. Um, even though that, that may be uncomfortable and it may be scary. Um, so I'm thankful for that. So now, excuse me if I refer to my notes quite a bit, but I'm going to throw some slides at you. I hope you can see them pretty good. Um, essentially we're going to have a discipleship pathway. This pathway is going to start by with the word facilitate. We're going to move in this circle, facilitate, relate, equip, send, and duplicate. Send and duplicate really kind of stand together, but they're two different real purposes. So when we talk about facilitate, we're talking about house groups, group meetings. I don't, it could happen at a coffee shop, at a, at a pub. I don't, I don't care. It doesn't matter. It's groups that uh, will be facilitate that will have a facilitator um, 
and that's all it is. It's group sessions with others, with scripture, with God, with questions and reflection. And it's doing relationship together, and that's the next part, relate. We're going to be an authentic and transparent relationship with your group and with God. You're just going to do life together. We equip. We talk about um, identifying others, who, especially within the group, who God is building up to facilitate a new discipleship group, a new house group, a new group that meets at a pub or a coffee house. I don't care. <laughs> a new group. And we equip them as the Holy Spirit guides. And we send them. This would be about a one-year process. You start your own facilitation group, and toward the end of that first year, you start to equip somebody, and then you're going to send them. You send that new facilitator while maintaining a relationship with them. The relationships don't end. Real discipleships, those relationships don't end even though we send them. And then that's duplicating. The person you send duplicates that exact same model, and you duplicate that same model again. It's a cycle of discipleship. Um, if we, if we don't duplicate a cycle of discipleship, discipleship stops. If we don't keep having relationships, discipleship stops. And, um, we were called to make disciples. And if we're called to make disciples, we're called to duplicate. I think that goes together. And the word relationship also goes together. All three of those words have to exist when we talk about this. And we're going to have a, we are going to have a commitment to accountability, but when we talk about pursuing effective discipleship, that, that should just be obvious. And I think scripture makes that very clear too. There's, there has to be accountability in discipleship, in relationship. You keep your best friends accountable. Why wouldn't you keep uh, your discipleship relationship accountable either? You would, <clears throat> you know, as a facilitator, it's, it's important. It's committed, even though times will get hard. And even though this will be edifying, and it will be fun and it will, um, deepen our relationship with with god the father spirit son and it will deepen our relationship with each other in faith it's not always going to be easy because the enemy doesn't like it the enemy doesn't want us to make build relationships and the enemy does not want us to make disciples but we're going to be planting seeds deep in the soil of discipleship that will last way beyond our life to transform lives of more people than we can imagine over time but we have to stay honest open and transparent Simple acronym for that is HOT. We have to have conversations with each other. We have to continue to lift each other up in any, any way possible so that we can continue effective discipleship. Um, some, of the, some of the expectations of the group, as, especially as we live into it, this, this might not happen right away for every group, but I don't think they're very difficult things to happen either. Um, <clears throat> some of these things are that we'll, we'll meet at least twice monthly the the group itself the facilitator and their uh about eight person total group or more is, is what we would shoot for we're going to follow a yearly scripture regimen um and that would include readings outside of the scheduled group times and we're going to utilize facilitator discussion questions and a, and those will adapt as your group takes on its own identity but there will be some provided i have uh, access to resources that I will provide to all facilitators as time goes on until they start to uh, have that freedom in their framework to to do that on their own. And that's something that we just keep in conversation about so that we can benefit each other as these new resources come available. And we're going to keep relationships active outside of the sc scheduled meetings. It can't just be a couple times a month we're in relationship. And monthly, I would, uh, I would expect the facilitators, or as it grows, um, several groups of facilitators to meet, to brainstorm, to encourage, to share resources, new things they've come up with, uh, ask for help and advice, and keep that open line of honesty and transparency. Quarterly, I would really encourage all of the groups to organize a volunteer or donation opportunity to a cause that the group finds mutually meaningful. And biannually to yearly, all groups would, uh, I would hope to be able to facilitate a large group meeting for all, just for a large, larger connectional gathering. And then by somewhere around the end of the year, September, October, we do our best to identify uh, a potential new facilitator, and that's the equipping and the sending and the duplicating to, uh, to go and make their own discipleship pathway group in, in the beginning of the new year. You know, at the meetings, it's really going to look like your own little individual worship service. We're going to catch up. Joyce, how, how have you experienced God this week? Concerns, how can we be in prayer? We can talk about the scripture readings with questions that are, that are provided or that come up with as the group 
develops will be open to we'll have to be open to perspectives that are not our own we may not agree on the same way that we interpret pieces of scripture but we have to all agree on loving god and loving each other and what happens in the group stays in the group it keeping um keeping confidentiality is going to be very important there's going to be lifelong relationships we have to be able to have trust in each other and that's going to be very important and unless somebody's life's at risk unless some laws are being broken we really have to keep confidentiality you should really be able to say if if somebody outside of your relationship group your discipleship group knows something that was said it's because that person told them not because of you because they need to trust that you did not spread anything about them no gossips that's all it comes down to no gossips I think, I think most people are mature enough not to gossip, but I've been proven wrong. So, um, and as, as your group's identity grows and and is matured, you can consider some creative expressions. You know, maybe uh, maybe somebody in the group is a musician, and you you start off with a, a song or something that's that's live, or um, maybe you all really like campfires and you start to do it with some s'mores or maybe you, uh, you like crafts or painting or anything like that. And you can start to bond over some activities like that. And that's just, you expressing each other's, um, giftedness and drawing closer to God and each other in that relationship and finish time by reminding everyone, of course, of the next day and time that the gathering will happen and, um, the next steps like the weekly readings or anything like that. So now we're going to talk about what this actually looks like over time. Um, th those meetings, I think, sound simple. It's simple accountability. It's things that I think really a lot of us are yearning for anyway, just to be in a, a relational group with each other, a relationship that doesn't end, a relationship that can grow over time to be deeper and deeper. And it duplicates, and your, your social network actually grows, and it grows in person, not just online. I think we all would prefer an in-person relationship these days. We... We were all stuck. Most of us were stuck inside for over a year. Some of us still are unable to come out as much as we would like to. So I, I think that in-person relationship is going to be huge for all eternity and for all time that we have on, on this life and in the next. Um, anyway, that was a little off script, but we're going to talk about what this, what this discipleship duplication actually looks like. You know, year one, I'm, I'm hoping for... for um, four house groups to start, four, four little networks. Some people have called them cells. Um, some people have called them band meetings. That would be a more of a Methodist term. It doesn't really have to quite be like that, but whatever you decide to call it, it's your group. It's, the, it's a group that you would facilitate or you would be a part of, and that's fine too. But I, I'm looking to identify four people. I'll be one of them. Um, at least four groups to start, um, in the next couple of months, hopefully by the new year. That would be four groups. And if we have an eight person average, I, I just kind of see eight people per group being a healthy average. And if it's a little more, maybe up to like 14 and maybe sometimes it'll be six, you know, it, it, it's okay. But it may be an average across the groups of about eight, I think is healthy. Um, so that's, those are the numbers I'm going to be, I'm going to be running with as we move on in the slides. <clears throat> so right, right away, we're going to start the new year with Four groups at an eight-person average. It's a 32-person network starting the new year with that. Sounds good to me. Now, in one year, toward the end of next year, September, October, we start to really talk about what it looks like to equip somebody and send somebody to, to build their own um, house group. And what that looks like starting that next year is eight groups with a 64 person network so it really just doubles it doubles the group size it doubles the the amount of people and i'm just you know i'm not going to drag on with the math but i'm going to go i'm going to go several steps deep and <clears throat> year three if uh if you say you're a facilitator if you duplicate again and the one that you duplicated for year two duplicates we just doubled again we have a 16 group network with 128 people in three years. In three years, if, we've, if we're able to follow this model at this pace, we have created a network of people that are bigger than the four churches that I serve. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. I'm saying that this type of, this duplicable discipleship and this, this whole thing, 
this model has worked. This isn't brand new. I've just tweaked it to see what I to, to what I think so far will yield success in discipleship. It's worked in other places through other facilitators. And I know it'll work around here because I know people are begging for relationships like this. So in year by year three, we've started a network that's essentially bigger as far as in-person Sunday worships than four churches combined. Year, year four, it's going to double again, 32 groups, 256 people. And we keep going. You can see, you can see the slides. Year 5, 64, 512. Let's go to year 8. 512 groups, 4,096 people. By the start of year 11, there's a potential of 4,096 groups being started probably across several counties with 32,768 people in a network. All because we decided to have a discipleship authentic relationship with one another for the glory of God and growing his kingdom. Friends, I know it's not going to be easy, and I know putting it on paper is not even half the battle. But this is what I'm going to relentlessly pursue, and I'm going to relentlessly pursue it inside and outside of the churches. And I know that God is going to bless all the lives of anybody who takes part in anything to do with discipleship. And like I said at the beginning, if this is not for you, that's okay. But God is calling you to go and make disciples. And we need to really figure out how to equip you to go and make disciples. And if it's not through this kind of network, that is okay. Just please have conversation with me or anyone else on what it looks like to go and do what God is calling you to do to go and make disciples. And that's the whole point. This was what I really feel God is calling me to do through the churches and outside of the churches. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm listening to God 100%. I know the devil's going to get in the way, but that's okay. I'm just going to chop him down by the Holy Spirit. It's fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll suffer through it. So, friends, I'm going to go make disciples. But first, let's pray. Lord, the sacrifice of your son is a precious gift. We don't deserve it, and we can never have earned it. Thank you for your grace and mercy and love to give it to us anyway. You gave up everything for us, even though you were pure and righteous, and we are full of sin. Thank you for breaking the chains that kept us in bondage to sin. Thank you for the freedom we now have in you. And we want to follow your example as your disciples. Help us to also give up everything and take up our cross. We don't want to live in slavery to the ways of the world. We want to embrace the freedom that you paid for with your blood. We desire to pursue a relationship with you fervently, with no attachment to the things of this world. We see the example that you have been to us. And we see the example of the people of faith that have gone before us. Help us to be faithful and fearless, just like those who have gone before us and blazed the trail of discipleship. Help us to take up our cross daily and to build your kingdom and yours alone as we listen to your words as we go and make disciples. Amen. Go and make disciples. Amen.